days. I'm an infectious disease doctor. I'm on my 32nd and last year of practice, 10 months, 15 days to go, but who's counting? I've also been a science, a blogger, and over in science-based medicine, writing about alternative medicines on and off since 2008. So I've done a bunch of this stuff over the years. And it's always important to mention conflicts of interest. For those of you who, for people occasionally in the audience who say, I only do this because I'm a drug company puppet, it's not true. If you go to Dollars for Doctors, you won't see my name. The only thing I have ever, in 40 years, taken from a drug company rep is that Fleet Cinema, which the Unison rep gave me when he left the hospital because he didn't like me. And I still have that Fleet Cinema sitting on my desk in case there's ever a constipation emergency. But I've never taken anything ever from a pharmaceutical rep. Not only that, so I have no conflicts of interest. I do like military history, so I do have an interest in conflicts. Thank you much. I'll be here all day. So we're going to cover three broad, uh, two broad classifications of alt med. Three. They always say that um, five out of four Americans don't understand math. But we're going to talk about <laughs> repurposing of standard medications, which has been a big deal. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, reality denial. And then we're going to talk about the usual suspects, acupuncture, homeopathy, chiropractic, naturopathy, the real lacaloon stuff that is out there. We're going to look at what's the published literature. So I'm not going to talk about chiropractor sites or naturopathy sites. We're going to talk about the studies I found on PubMed where they use the usual suspects in their approach to COVID. So, one important, a couple of background slides. Um, one is important when treating, when you read the stuff, in treating infectious diseases. When you treat infectious diseases, you are always targeting a specific biologic pathway in the organism that's important for their livelihood. So when you're killing bugs, which I do for a living, you want to interfere with one biologic pathway or another. In acute viral infections, you usually want to target that in less than 76 hours. And as an aside, that's why the therapies we've had for COVID have been so unimpressive, is most patients hit the door about day seven, eight, nine of their illness. And so that when disavir, for example, is unimpressive is not a surprise, because one of the aggravating things about COVID has been it's this long, slow disease instead of a very acute disease. And really, any intervention that you don't get within a day or three is not going to be effective against COVID predictably. And then there's issues of immunomodulation, but we're not going to talk about that. That's a whole hour or two talk in and of itself. It's also important to remember that most of this research findings are false. I'm going to have this article put on my tombstone when I die. It's the one of the few I have quoted the most over the years. It's important to remember that most of the medical literature is garbage. Uh, they're badly done studies, and you can't believe what's out there. You have to be really picky about those things. One of the interesting things in general, too, is that most medical doctors don't have the background to understand alt-med. And they are really remarkably gullible, as we will see at mm -hmm. one point, about believing what's published science or published science, I guess. So be skeptical. Most novel therapies don't work. Most only provide cost and toxicity. And this is real therapies that have a biologic plausibility, not including the things for like homeopathy or acupuncture, which are entirely disconnected from known reality. And then, I'm a Bayesian kind of guy, and Bayes' theorem makes my head hurt. I took and dropped statistics four times in college. Once I got past the bell-shaped distribution of flipping the coin, I just gave up and went on to somewhere else. And so, but the best way to think about Bayes' theorem as a clinician and as a physician is that the prior part, the, whether or not a study or a result is true depends on the probability, prior probability, that it could be true. So for example, in Oregon, there's no line in the Willamette Valley. So a line test has zero prior probability of being true, so a positive test is probably a false positive. When approaching alternative medicine, the prior probability that homeopathy, acupuncture, naturopathy, chiropractic is going to be effective is zero. So any positive study is going to be a false positive study because the prior probability 
then it's going to be effective to zero because they're all garbage. And so when you're approaching these things, think of it from a Bayesian point of view. You can use the the uh, the uh, formula there, but uh, it just makes my brain hurt. I feel like Mr. Gumby from Monty Python or Dr. Gumby. How many people watch Monty Python? Okay, good. Here's the thing. Kids today, the new house staff, they don't know Monty Python. Oh, they man. They've never read the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh, man. These kids are clueless. They, they're going to be your doctor. We're someday. doomed. We're doomed. We're doomed. And, uh, don't get me started. You know? <laughs> uh, they just don't understand normal culture. And then Harriet Hall, a prior history, and Harriet Hall uh, calls it tooth fairy science, which I think is a good way to it think is. about alternative medicine. <laughs> You can do a lot of studies on the tooth fairy. What kind of tooth is fed? What kind of money comes from a given tooth? Is it the fifth tooth, the fourth tooth, the third tooth? But the fundamental principle is there a tooth fairy is not true. And all of alternative medicine studies are tooth fairy science. And that's another th important thing to remember. The other thing when you read the medical literature, as I do for a living for 10 months and 14 more days, <laughs> Remember that when someone comes up with some unique and somewhat crazy idea for how a novel therapy works, they come up with all these incredible potential mechanisms, but they're garbage. And there's a lot of that in the medical literature. You really see this, I thought this was best for like cold fusion. They, some guy came up with cold fusion, and all of a sudden there are all these papers of why cold fusion can work. Wrong, cold fusion doesn't work. All the explanations are garbage. And this is true for all medicine. So you can see, and we'll see some later in the talk, all these wonderful explanations for why this or that other therapy should work, when in fact they have no plausibility. And this is a big problem in the medical literature, because you can snow them with BS for explanations for how some medical theory or other works. And as a rule, they aren't effective. So as an example, you guys remember this. I didn't get the videos to work, unfortunately. But you might remember President SFB talked about um, having ultraviolet light, and powerful light, or drinking a disinfectant to get rid of COVID. And this was a brief bit of funniness or uh, humor that went on for a bit. It was come and gone. But if you really think about that particular approach, it is a bad idea for starters. <laughs> Shortly afterwards, there was an increase in disinfectant consumption in destiny. States. So, you know, these things are not harmless to people. People listen to people in authority, like me, <laughs> and, and then uh, follow the advice, and then they die of drinking bleach. And there's a big bolus of people drinking bleach and dying shortly after uh, that. But this is sort of an, that was sort of an archetype of the proponents for what you could call alternative medicine. I mean, the president was a personification of Dunning-Kruger, i.e., the more you know about, the less you know about something, the more confident you are that you know what you're talking about. Talking utter nonsense. Welcome to alternative medicine. And I don't think alternative medicine is a good term. I mean, what are we going to call it? An alternative to what? Reality? I mean, <laughs> complementary medicine? You're not complementing regular medicine. To quote one of the greatest authors of all time, me, <laughs> When you mix cow pie with apple pie, you don't make cow pie better, you make apple pie worse. Compli that, those are not complementary to anything I do for a living. Quackery is an old term, and being an Oregon duck, quackery feels bad at calling it. I've called it cutely, I didn't make up the term, scam years ago, supplemental, complementary, and alternative medicine. It's kind of too cute by half. I've been calling it for scams for years, but I think the new term is Thanks, whoops. This thanks to uh, Dr. Frankenstein. He said we're in, uh, in uh, Young Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein, thank you. Um, Dr. Frankenstein says, uh, you are talking about the nonsensical ravings of a lunatic mind. Ooh. One of the things that occurred to me in the last four or five years for other reasons is we give people who spout nonsense too much credit. And we're too nice to them. And so I think we should call it the nonsensical ravings of the lunatic mind medicine. Because I really think that NRLM is the way to go. That's not going to win friends and influence people. But the other thing I've learned in the last 10 years, you're not going to win friends and influence people. Yeah. So you might as well have fun with it. So let's start with repurposed antibiotics for COVID. Just as 
a background and start with a sh my favorite Shakespeare quote, which I always twist one way or another. But really, uh, these are all sound, and uh, a tale told by an idiot, all sound and fury signifying nothing. But why do we do this? What happened? I think it's good to review them briefly. So we'll start with Azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine. The studies have shown did nothing for COVID. Fine. As Dr. Oz approved, he knew right to that. No good for anything. But, and it's interesting, both um, azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine do have immunomodulatory effects, but that's not important clinically most of the time. But because of the initial studies, a lot of time and money and effort and hassle was spent arguing with patients, you don't need this stuff, that it was effective. And where did this come from? And this kind of thing happens all the time in regular medicine. Somebody comes up with some potential study to show effect. So in this case, there was a paper that suggested that hydroxychloroquine and zithromycin in the test tube decrease the viral load of COVID which is interesting. What happens in the test tube may not happen in the person, but this kind of thing happens all the time where a minor paper, which is more to generate an idea, gets blown all out of proportion. And then people want the medication, people want the therapy. We you know it's probably not going to be effective. There's no reason to think from basic principles of either zithromycin or hydroxychloroquine that have any effect on COVID whatsoever. There are good drugs for, say, malaria or Legionella, but they're not going to be effective in the treatment of a virus which has a whole different biologic pathway. But this happens all the time. And so this started with a Frenchman, and I love the French. I'm a big fan of French culture, but they like crazy Warm stuff. Time. They are big in beliefs in homeopathy. They thought the Maginot line was going to do something. And in this case, <laughs> this gentleman came up um, with the study that showed that it decreased the viral load. Um, he looks exactly like Theoden King. I mean, put a little glasses on, he could be Lord of the Rings. That's amazing, separated at birth. But he showed that it decreased viral load, and so that became a big deal, and people wanted these drugs. Subsequently, multiple studies have shown that neither drug causes any clinical effect on the outcomes of COVID. The hospitalizations are the same, the death rates are the same, there's no clinical effect whatsoever. It doesn't help. Um, but, and as always in people who are big believers in non-effective therapies, he was not happy about the, quote, dictatorship of methodologists who insist upon randomization and control groups. Now, why don't they like that? As is so often the case, when they get a randomized clinical control prospective studies, is that the mice did nothing? Hydroxychloroquine did nothing. Mm -hmm. And these are great drugs. They only gave toxicity and cost, but zithromycin is not a benign drug. I mean, there's a small but real risk of cardiac arrest when you're on the zithromycin. It's like one in a million. It's unusual. But I try not to give a zithromycin or another drug uh, that does that, uh, the quinolones, unless I have a very compelling reason to. Because occasionally you're going to kill somebody with these drugs. Um, and all people are offering patients with COVID who often have cardiac involvement is you're giving them a cardiotoxic drug. That doesn't seem wise to me. But fortunately, that's gone by the wayside. And currently, clinically, nobody's been arguing with us to give them hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin. Although somebody did call in last week and called us ah, Satanistic rat bags. Oh, Jesus, that hurts. My nurse said, no, we don't do that. And he called us the Satanistic rat bags and hung up. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh. A badge of honor. I'm sorry? A badge of honor. I think it's a badge of honor. Yeah. And so the current one, which we haven't gotten over yet, is ivermectin, which is an anti-parasitic drug, which I've given over the years for parasitic drugs, or, sorry, parasitic infections. Again, it started, why does it work? Where did it come up with? Well. Whenever you're looking for new drugs, you check it in the test tube. And they, they looked on cell cultures, and they found that giving ivermectin decreased the viral load uh, in the, in the um, test tube, which is an interesting starting point to say, oh, maybe there's something unique going on here with this drug, but you have to test it in animals and humans and all sorts of stuff. But this is a time where they went straight from the test tube, as it were. It wasn't really a test tube, they were placing cells on it. 
um, and to people demanding it in human beings. And this happens all the time. Just because you can kill something in a test tube doesn't mean oh. it's going to be effective in a human being. And you can see the comment. Sorry, let's just get to the side there. I love it. What's that comment? XKCD. XKCD has more great uh, comments if you're a lecturer than any of them. Uh, and <laughs> it looked great in a test tube. And remember I mentioned the uh, cold fusion? These are all the different pathways they think that ivermectin might work to have efficacy. Every one of those exits is some place where it might be effective in COVID. But guess what? Although they found 20 different potential mechanisms, and they said in this article, which reviewed all these potential mechanisms, it is still unclear if any of these activities will play a role in prevention and treatment of disease. So you can find potential things to test to, but is it going to translate to human beings and the treatment of human beings? As you probably know with ivermectin, the answer is no. <clears throat> High quality studies, randomized placebo controlled studies, don't show ivermectin does anything clinically against COVID-45, which is interesting. Um, and what's more interesting is there has been a lot of fraud, much to my surprise, in the ivermectin studies. We looked at very closely, many of the studies, the, all the studies that show efficacy turn out to be fraudulent or even worse than badly done, um, that they, they really did all the numbers wrong, etc. And it really boggles my mind that anybody would do critical medicine and, and um, lie about it. Because people's lives depend on it. And you see this occasionally. There's some more brouhaha now that the uh, Alzheimer's studies may have been fraudulent. And there's been some uh, pain anesthesia studies that have been fraudulent. What, I, you know, I'm an atheist, but there should be a special section of hell for people who agree. do that, because that is just beyond appalling that they do this. And they, there's a nice review about um, the, a third of the trials that have been published for ivermectin have, have fraudulent or have errors of potential fraud. And it's really quite remarkable that that's the case. When you take out the fraudulent studies and do a meta-analysis, ivermectin does nothing. So ivermectin is not a good drug for the treatment of COVID. And that's a recurrent theme, not only in medicine, but in, the, uh, um, in our LM medicine. That you find that you spend a lot of misleading evidence, evidence, um, leads to bad medicine, people spending time, effort, money, looking into getting, um, I'm getting a little carpal tunnel here this. Sorry. Um, and it really does not lead to good medicine. And this not only has happened with hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine or ivermectin, but this happens in medicine in general every now and then, and it happens with alternative medicine all the time. So switching gears, um, sort of stuff you read about. Vaccines, of course, is a whole topic, which you could go for a couple hours on, and I'm going to skip that one. Social distancing is another one. Um, but I just want to mention one thing about masking um, as an aside. I mean, it's, it's modestly effective in preventing the spread of COVID. First, virtually everybody looks better with a mask on. I don't know anybody who looks better when they take their mask on. I mean, really, we all look great from here up. We're all handsome and pretty from here up. Ugh. I like that with a mask on. Um, so first, I think we should wear masks on general principles because we look better. One thing you learn as a physician is there's a good reason why everybody wears clothes. <laughs> oh, we won't go there. Um, but one of the funny internet things is they have somebody putting a CO2 monitor on and they breathe into the CO2 monitor while wearing a mask and the CO2 levels go up. And then the argument is, oh look, we're all getting CO2 poisoning from wearing a mask. Just so you remember that that's actually what exhalation is supposed to do. When you see somebody exhaling, you're supposed to be breathing out CO2. The level is supposed to go up. If you don't, it's a problem. The other thing to also remember when we talk about the dead space here, 
most of your airway is dead space. You're moving air up and down in the dead space. It's about two thirds of a cup. What you add in the mask is negligible to the dead space that you have with normal breathing. And so it's just sort of, that's just sort of humorous. And you don't get increased CO2 retention and get problems from wearing a mask. If it did, your surgeon would be extremely dangerous. They wear masks all day long. I assume that when you go in and get your hip replaced or your, your bypass surgery, you're going to want your surgeon to wear a mask. And you probably don't think they're going to have CO2 retention and get crazy on the basis of that. So masks are good. They do, do, they do decrease the um, spread of COVID. And like everything else in infection control, it's the sum of multiple interventions that are beneficial for stopping the spread of infections. So no single thing is going to do it. But I usually wear a mask for most things that I um, um, inside. My wife wants me to wear one in the house all the time. I don't understand. <laughs> Why? She says you look better. <laughs> so let's move on to these alternative, I'm uh, sorry, the usual suspects. Um, and there are actually a remarkable amount of literature in the last literature. I mean, medical literature is to the literature what you know the phone book is to the literature. I mean, it's not like reading you know, Dostoevsky or, or, um, or um, a good novel. I don't know why they call it the literature. It's just never been a good term. But if you look at the medical literature, when, as I did this talk, there were 77 hits for homeopathy and COVID, um, 51 for chiropractic, 213 for acupuncture and traditional Chinese pseudomedicine, which kind of surprised me at first. But then, oh no, it all started in China. If you look at all the studies, virtually all of them are out of China. There's not, and then I think the future for for uh, for NLRN medicine is going to be long COVID, because one of those things that makes people feel bad. We still don't understand what's causing it. Uh, it's miserable for those who have it, and it's the perfect thing for um, alternative practitioners to screw. I'm uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> people for their uh, therapies published in the medical literature on those particular therapies and uh, COVID-45. First, first is naturopathy. And, you know, naturopaths are sort of the, the uh, jack of all quackery. They do many crazy things. Um, uh, so there is no specific naturopathic intervention. They do all sorts of interesting therapies on people. And, it's just interesting to show, they, the study looked at, well, what were they doing for patients with mild and moderate COVID? And the number of interventions was truly remarkable. They gave bone broth, they gave, um, whatever the hell, oh, beetroot. I, I was reading that as beetroot too. <laughs> and greens. They were giving IV vitamin C and IV vitamin K and they were giving IV magnesium, and they were giving uh, IV vitamin B12, and they were giving zinc and pyridoxine IV. And it was just amazing the number of therapies. I mean, multiple different therapies for patients with mild to mild COVID. And they all got better. Well, guess what? Most patients with mild to mild COVID all get better. That's what the disease does. But that's what natural baths do. They give multiple expensive therapies to people, usually that aren't insured, they often pay out of pocket, and um, they don't know if they do any good or not, because they're multiple different interventions. They said in the study, well, we need prospective clinical trials to confirm that this efficacy against COVID-45 is warranted. And no, you don't. I mean, every one of these studies ends, we need more studies. No, we don't. I always like the fact that naturopaths actually think they know what they're doing. And the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians suggests that they play a valuable role as frontline primary care physicians. If you look at how naturopaths are trained, that is the opposite of true. Their understanding of medicine is remarkably um, slim at best. And anybody, any therapy where any group that uses homeopathy as their primary therapy modality cannot be trusted. But they think that's the case. And, for, and it's also naturopathy, not naturopathy, 
is big in India. And this was one title that said, uh, for COVID, science or superstition? I thought, oh, right, superstition. I can answer that question. You don't need a whole lot of people. And they were, this is, again, the things that naturopaths are doing. They gave 10 people ionized saline. So you got COVID, you get 200 mils of ionized saline, and they all got better in eight days, which is what everybody does in eight days. Thank you for watching the natural history of disease. And the thing about this ionized therapy is like 200 mils. So this is sort of like saying, okay, the swimming pool is dirty. I'm going to put a quarter cup of bleach in a bucket, stir it, toss it in the pool, and my pool is now clean. That's sort of how these ionized therapies work. And it's, you know, interesting stuff. I, I wrote a whole blog article on science-based medicine on ionized saline, ozone, oh, sorry, ozoneized therapy. But it doesn't work. But they say, guess what? They all got better. Well, of course, they all got better. That's what they do. Homeopathy <laughs> is water. And you don't even get water because they put a drop on a sugar pill and they give you a sugar pill. I just... Homeopathy is so delusional. I cannot believe that anybody actually suggests it, but they do. Um, and what really surprised me, and this is an example how real medicine is clueless when they examine alternative medicine. So Pulmonary Advisor, which is a site for pulmonologists where they log on and get you know, all these websites where you can get caught up in the vast amount of literature. And they, uh, and they found it, and they asked the question, can homeopathic treatment speed recovery in patients with COVID-45? And the answer, of course, no. Homeopathy is ridiculous. It's two fairy science. You can't do quality studies. But when you read regular doctors reading alternative medicine studies, they are so often like, you know, the, uh, the clueless rude who just fell off the turnip truck. And they were referring to this particular study where patients got a hodgepodge of homeopathic therapies. And you can see the different ones here. And they got better. Big surprise. They supposedly got better, and they say at the study that a major limitation in the study is the fact that uh, patients could not get the hospital tests and follow up that they wanted to get. No, the major limitation in the study is they were testing homeopathy, which is stupid. It's water. There's no reason it works. Why are you even looking at this in pulmonary advisor? And this happens all the time in medicine, and it drives me nuts. But the nice thing about homeopathy is it can lead to probably the funniest thing ever put in the medical literature. Coming up on the day, ooh, yeah, maybe it's not so funny, but we'll see. So this was a study that looked at um, homeopathy retrospective in the treatment of hospitalized patients. And uh, it's the funny, 13 patients got a hodgepodge of nothing. But the funniest thing here was the statement, quote, at the start of therapy, each patient received influenza either at 200 C, or in the case of very bad, 10,000 C. Now, I don't know if you know homeopathic dilutions. If you're, the more you dilute it, the more powerful it becomes. At 13 C, there's not a single molecule left in the, um, the nostril. If it's 200 C, you'd have to give 2 billion doses per second to 6 billion people for 4 billion years to get a single molecule. And they're giving the sickest people 10,000 C. There's probably not enough volume in the multiverse to find a single molecule after that. But I found that, I actually laugh, I, you do not want to read the homeopathic literature while drinking milk because it will come out your nose on the keyboard. Guaranteed. I think that's the most funny thing I've ever read about homeopathy. Needless to say, they suggested that although there was no statistically difference, significant difference in patients treated with homeopathy or placebo, they need to do bigger trials, which I don't understand. It's just not a trial. It doesn't work. There's no reason for it for work. Why would you want to do a bigger trial? But you see this as a theme in each of the... Um, homeopathic trials that you read. And I also like this about, um, they, you know, the thing is you see a natural, you see an alternative medicine, they always say they're gonna um, individualize things. 
Yeah. You're an individual. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's nice if you're a narcissist. Sorry. You guys are all interchangeable parts. <laughs> Not really. I mean, but one of the powers of modern medicine is that I know what's going to work on the vast majority of people because everybody is pretty much the same, which is what I think is nice about people. We're all pretty much the same. Some are a little more psychopathic than others, some have a little more of this. There's variation in everybody's immune system that can't, it's fine points that we're all not the same, and some people are more predisposed to dying of COVID and somebody less predisposed. So there's subtle differences in all of us. But really, the power of medicine comes in the fact that you come in with syphilis, I'm going to kill a penicillin. And your syphilis is going to be like everybody else's syphilis. And I think that's kind of nice. I like being, in some respect, a cog in the wheel. Maybe not a cog, but the same, because my doctor's going to know what to do for me. I think that's kind of nice. But what they say, they're going to individualize their homeopathic therapy. Except when you have an epidemic. Then they're going to individualize it for the group, which I don't know how you individualize the therapy for the group. So homeopaths really are trying to have it both ways. And that's the strange thing if you're a reality-based clinician like I am. At the end of the day, when you read all these articles, because you get a hodgepodge of therapies, like in homeopathy, everybody gets their individualized therapy, or acupuncture, or whatever. Everybody gets something different, and they don't get better. It's actually not what they're doing that is the efficacious agent. It's the philosophy that works. So if you come and see me, uh, and you have a kind of heart valve infection, I'm going to give you whatever is appropriate, hope get you better. I'm going to give you this specific therapy, and I'm going to individualize it for that. But it's not medicine that works. It's my antibiotic that works. It's the opposite of alternative medicine. It's not the intervention that works. It's the philosophy that works. Which I think it's, you think about kind of a weird way to approach medicine. Um, but it is. And it's amazing that they're still giving no sodes in testing them. If you don't know what those are, those are the naturopathic answer to vaccines. They take a little bit of an active COVID and dilute it up and give it to you as a vaccine. Now, the scary thing about that, if you think about it, it's like, okay, COVID virus, probably no big deal. But they actually have no sodes for syphilis. So they've taken syphilitic material from a human, mixed it up, hopefully diluted it appropriately, so there's nothing left, and they injected it. There was a guy who got in trouble because he was trying to get some Ebola material so he could make an Ebola no so. But can you imagine? I'm going to sneak up, I'm going to get some Ebola material from you, take it home, mix it up in saline, dilute it a bunch of times, and give it to people. Ooh. And they even have, and they're even testing it in England where, you know, they, we have efficacious vaccines. Why are they testing no sods in human beings? It makes no sense to me. And there's even a homeopathic immunotherapy. When you get a patient who survived COVID, you take their antibodies off, and instead of giving it to them a serum, which didn't work, unfortunately, but um, you dilute it out and you give them that. It's like, this gets weirder and weirder and weirder. But they publish trials. Acupuncture is a huge topic. I have a whole talk on acupuncture alone. As Dr. Novella says, it's theatric placebo. Um, and again, when you look at acupuncture, there is no such thing as acupuncture as a single thing, like there's penicillin as a single thing. Every single form of acupuncture is different. Every practitioner, because they're not based in reality, sticks needles in different places. There are dozens upon dozens upon dozens of forms of acupuncture. It's really remarkable when you read it from that respect. Um, and, and all the studies in PubMed, or firstly all the studies are coming out of China, which is, makes it a little bit more skeptical because the literature does show that there's never been a negative study out of China for acupuncture. They're always positive. They always show benefit, which is an effect that vanishes when you go out of China. And again, if you go back to why all the medical literature is false, it's because a lot of studies just confirm the current bias that you're practicing. So the bias, my brother spends a lot of time in China. You know, he had a girlfriend who, whose brother was an acupuncturist, and 
I mean, true believers that what they're doing is something. That's the bias. And that bias really will skew what you do. And there's also been, unfortunately, a lot of fraud in biomedicine in China. So you kind of get a little bit skeptical on the basis of the literature there. Now, I think COVID is due to a virus that binds the ACE receptor in human beings. ACE2 receptor causes a bunch of effects, therefore, inflammation. It's just, you guys can read this briefly, but this is the acupuncture slash traditional Chinese pseudo-medicine idea of what COVID is. And actually, it makes no sense. I mean, it really doesn't. If you read this and you understand bio biology and chemistry and all the stuff that you have to know to understand modern medicine, it's like, is a dampness toxin pestilence? I don't know. I mean, that's having cockroaches in your basement. <coughs> One meta-analysis, again, it's had good effect for a variety of outcomes, but high quality evidence is lacking, which is a key thing, because high quality studies never show benefit from these things. They had Chinese herbal medicine, again, a hodgepodge of treatments for the hodgepodge of endpoints, and again, poor quality studies, so you really don't know what it means. Um, I already said that. And again, if you're a, if you're a tree-hugging liberal like I've always been, if, if you really want to protect the environment, you really should avoid traditional Chinese pseudo medicine. It's all, I have a whole lecture, a whole talk on that, on um, science-based medicine, but the impact when you have millions of people eating and taking threatened species to pointlessly for therapies, the impact that this is having on the environment is absolutely appalling. Um, and for no other reason, if you're a, if you're a, um, Especially if you're from Eugene. I mean, no one in Eugene isn't a tree hugging liberal. You shouldn't be doing that stuff. That's the environment. Chiropractic. Um, surprisingly, there's no articles on chiropractic intervention for COVID. I was actually quite surprised by that. Wow. Um, I think because most of the stuff that's been published is the fact that chiropractors are trying to figure out how to practice in an era where you can't get close to people and touch them. And so there was a lot of studies, how are we going to do this because we can't get close to people in touch them, which is a benefit to their life. <laughs> and the chiropractic students wrote a hilarious article. The title said, chiropractic students call for action against substantiated claims. I think they're trying to put themselves out of business because that's pretty much all of chiropractic. Most of the literature on chiropractic and COVID-45 is on, as I say, trying to practice remotely, how are you going to adjust the spine over a tele, uh, telemedicine, and the fact that there's lots and lots of misinformation from the chiropractors. There's Dr. Weil et al. And again, doc, the integrative medicine folks try to practice like naturopaths. And these are all the different things that they recommended for the treatment of COVID and, and uh, long COVID. And it's really quite remarkable on things that don't work. My personal favorite, aromatherapy. My personal favorite was um, this one. Uh, when they looked at the med uh, system systematic review, again, poor quality studies. You know, you really can't say because of low quality studies. But the funny thing was that, which is funny, zinc is likely to shorten the duration of olfactory dysfunction. Now, what's the big side effect of zinc tablets? You lose your sense of smell. So I think that was kind of funny. And I don't quite know how to do that in there. But if you take zinc tablets because you have a cold, you might get things better a little faster, but your big downside is you lose your sense of smell. And that one actually makes it come back faster with COVID-45. That's an interesting uh, result. But I think as I get, we're going to see most of this done for two more minutes. Um, long hauler syndrome and long COVID. This is going to be a primary source to screw people over with pointless therapies that do nothing. And so anyway, that's a brief look at really an enormous number of things that you could look at. Um, personally, I'm going to a beer spa. <laughs> to me, if I have to do an alternative medicine, beer spa. Very well for me. But these are all the different natural 
therapies, and all of them at one form or another will be looked at for COVID, and most of them, if not all of them, are a complete waste of time for that brief overview. So I will stop there for questions. Um, if you want to read my blog entries, the science-based medicine, where I'm still a blogger, they're all collected, at least my first decade, as a book, which you can get on Amazon. You've got to pick yourself. And this October, I'm having my first novel, Skeptics in the Pub. Call Yay! It. So I'm actually, instead of, bo <laughs> instead of boring you with nonfiction, I'm now going to bore you with fiction. And so if, you, if, you're, if your doctor's not giving you the ambient you need, so I can't sleep at night, the world's going to hell, I'm way too anxious, buy my novel, start reading, go right to sleep, <laughs> best thing ever, and I'll see if there's any questions that I was told to talk for 40, and I talked for 45. Oh, that was that no, that's, that's a joke. Yeah. Really? Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you think that when doctors talk about the art of medicine as part of their practice, is that attitude to make them more vulnerable to exactly black theories? Uh, generally speaking, the art of medicine has to do with diagnostic uncertainty because you often, patients never read the textbook and present like the textbook. So you're always trying to figure out, with, eh, this is not normal, and that's not really. So the art of medicine is more, in, di in my world, more with diagnostic uncertainty. Trying to figure out the vagaries, is this really what I think is going on or not? And to some extent, therapeutic interventions, sometimes you're presented with processes for which you have nothing to guide you. You know, this happens all the time in my world. Somebody shows up with a bug I never heard of in a space that shouldn't be infected, and I got to treat it. <laughs> space. And so I got to kind of guess, well, this should work. Brush your fingers. That, I don't know, but that's an interesting idea that I wouldn't, I have to think about more. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, is there any verdict on uh, vitamin D's relationship to COVID? Uh, that's something that's been both in conventional medicine and alternative medicines kind of been floating around. As generally speaking, when it comes to vitamin D, um, and last meta-analysis, and it's been like six months since I saw it, so it wasn't effective as a therapeutic drug. Generally speaking, it's good to be replete in your vitamins. This is a bunch of pale Oregonians. Most of you probably vitamin D deficient. Most of you probably avoid the sun. The studies do, and vitamin D is an important immunomodulator, and the studies do suggest if you're vitamin D deficient, you're probably more at risk for things like tuberculosis and viral infections. So it's good to be replete in your vitamins, whatever that may be. But generally speaking, super therapeutic vitamins don't do anything. They can only fill the gas tank up so much. So if you're replete in your vitamins, it's probably okay. It's probably a bad idea in general to be deficient in them. Um, but take an extra, and it's been shown more, and I don't remember specifically with COVID, but most of the other things, taking extra doesn't do anything. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Fauci is supposed to be taking 6,000 a day. I've heard about that. Yeah, but the, anyway, some people say that, the, you know, that, well, they vary so much from person to person. Once you get a drone, you test it actually, you don't know yeah. if you need it or not. That's why I just eat a lot of ice cream. I mean, made of milk, vitamin D. Oh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, I've heard the term holistic medicine. What's the term holistic? Uh, I mean, I always say that the only truly holistic doctors are infectious disease doctors. Because we have to think of it from, from a molecular level all the way up to the entire world. And nobody else has to do that when it comes to treating infections. Holistic generally means that they care about you as a human being. Um, and they, I think, and that they look at all aspects of your life. I mean, you look like with naturopaths, when they take a history from you, they will spend an hour or two and talk to you about your dreams, and talk to you about your relationships, and all this sort of stuff. And people like that. My job is a lot, some, I mean, we find bug, we kill bug, we go home. <laughs> I'm an infectious disease doctor. <laughs>
study the details is so <coughs> fun. You know, I'm that old. I remember from being a black and white TV just running through it. But yeah, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, you should be a little frightened because it's it's scary stuff. Yeah, I feel like this crowd knows that science changes. Yeah. Some people hear that science changes and they get freaked out like, oh, so it's all fake. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, it's just, like, it's just so hard to communicate with that. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you say we were fighting or not. We refine our knowledge. It's a series of peaks, and you keep seeing another peak as you go up. Let's do one more question. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I've been hearing a lot over the last few years. It sounds like crap to me. You know, CBD oil is yeah. how it all sorts of cures and stuff. Uh, it's something I've looked into. I CBC, CBD oil. Let's end there. Thanks, Mark. <laughs>